Great. Okay. Uh, so we're going to get started on chapter five, um, which is a, a, a chapter on probability. Probability uh, is kind of a unique little thing, so we could really kind of insert it wherever we want. Um, and so the reason I decided to start there to begin with is because you don't really need the information from chapters one, two, three, and four to get started on chapter five. And chapter five is probably one of the hardest chapters in the book. Uh, so I think it's good to get started early on it so that we can devote as much time as we need to it um, and not kind of brush over it quickly um, because it is a pretty, pretty hard chapter. Okay. All right. So probably the odds of things, uh, you know, probably run into uh, language of probability all, all over the place in our everyday life. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the odds or maybe playing the lottery, you know, just various chance games, uh, you know, cards, poker, blackjack, if there's any uh, Las Vegas fans. Uh, so there's a variety of, of ways in which we hear some of that language uh, from probability. Uh, so we're just going to formalize some of that in this chapter. Okay, so we begin with chapter 5, section 1. In this section, we'll cover uh, the probability rules. We're going to learn how to apply uh, some of the rules of probabilities, what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do. Of course, we have to cover some of the definitions um, uh, along, along with this. So, you know, statistics is a very difficult subject uh, for people. Um, I think it's, it's the first subject that that most people are exposed to that's very different from the traditional sequence of algebra, right? So if you ask people what is math about before they've ever experienced statistics, I, I think people's idea of what math is is associated to algebra. You know, when I tell people that I'm a mathematician, they think all I ever do is solve for x. Like here is an algebra equation, solve for x and that that's all we ever did in graduate school, solve for x. The problems just got more complicated or something. Um, but that's not really the case, right? Math is a very diverse field with lots of branches, and some of those branches are very, very different and very unique. Um, they all have some similarities, and some of the fundamental algebra and arithmetic things are, are pretty consistent through all of them but they are very different fields of study. So statistics is its own little thing, its own little branch, um, and it, it really uh, can be uh, studied with, with very little prerequisite information, um, though that's a whole other thing about what we should require and not other require. At any rate, um, so we're going to... Uh, we're going to cover some of the definitions that are needed, right? So in, in uh, probability, uh, statistics and probability, um, there's a lot of word problems and there's a lot of new definitions that we have to learn. So that's just part of the, the study and, and part of the challenge of statistics. I mean, a lot of definitions that you have to learn and it's not just about memorizing the word and the definition. You really have to think about what it means. Uh, and be very, very specific on its definition uh, and, and, and be able to apply it in a very particular way. Okay, so we're going to learn some definitions. Uh, we're going to learn about uh, empir the empirical method for probability, classical methods, um, and subjective probabilities, and uh, do some examples with those. Okay, so that's what 5.1 is about. You know, feel free to interrupt at any moment if you feel that I said something that's not clear enough or if you want further clarification on something, uh, please interrupt. That's what you're here for, right? So let me know. Okay, so uh, probability rules. So probability is the measure of the likelihood of a random phenomenon or chance behavior occurring. Probability describes the long-term proportion with in, in which a certain outcome will occur in situations with short-term uncertainty, okay? So there's this sort of duality that happens with a lot of phenomenon, where in the short term, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, but in the long term or in a sort of a global perspective, there is a certain amount of certainty, good? So, you know, lots of examples. Let's see, for example, um, 
how many people are, you know, say, say, let's say we go to a morbid place and think about deaths. Um, what are the odds? What are the chances that you know, somebody in this class, you know, dies uh, uh, of a disease not to be named? Um, well, okay, so the the chances are pretty small uh, for any one of us individually. Um, but if we if we look at the sort of global perspective, we consider the billions of people, then we can be more um, certain about what the outcomes are, are likely to be on a, on a global perspective. Mm, I don't think that that's a really good example. Let me think of another one. Um, say car accidents. Um, all of Los Angeles, right? Millions of people. I think we have, what, in the neighborhood of like 8 million residents or something like that. The odds that one of us gets in a car accident tomorrow kind of hard to calculate, right? And there's a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, I have no idea what the odds are. Just off the top of my head, just, just to kind of guess it, I have no idea what the odds are, or the chances are that one of us is going to get in a car accident tomorrow. However, as a global thing, if you're just looking at everybody in Los Angeles, we, we can be fairly, we can, we can have a certain amount of predictability as to how many accidents are going to happen. For the whole city, for the whole, you know, for the for tomorrow, or for the whole month, or for the whole year, right? We, if we look at historical data, we can see that there's some very uh, clear patterns that happen of how many accidents occur, um, you know, over a long period of time. Good short-term uncertainty, long-term predictability. Uh, going to Las Vegas, for example, if I sit down at a table of blackjack. Am I going to win? Am I going to lose? You know, who knows? There's a lot of uncertainty, unpredictability there. But from the perspective of the casino, um, they are playing, you know, they are uh, on the other side of the hand and they have uh, thousands and thousands of games happening with lots of players every single minute that the casino is, 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 is uh, active. Um, so you can apply math and statistics to to have a pretty good idea of how often they're going to win, right? Any individual game, it's up to chance, who knows? But over the long run, over lots of thousands and thousands of iterations of the game, you can be pretty certain that they're going to win a certain number of times. I think that with Blackjack, it's in the neighborhood of the low 50s. The casino is very, very comfortable guessing that about 55 to 60 percent of the time they're going to win. And they're, they can statistically consistently show that. Um, whereas an individual player that sits down, an individual hand, who knows? You could get lucky, right? Um, I sit down at the table, I put down my chip, I get a couple cards. I might get really lucky. That might be a great hand. I might be a winner. I could walk away as a winner, and that could be my experience. I won 100% of the time. I played once. I won once. 100% of the time, I walk away. Of course, that usually doesn't happen, right? You just sit there and you keep playing and keep playing until eventually you lose, right? You, you're up by a bunch of money, and then you're down a little bit of money, and then you're up by a bunch of money, and if you just keep playing, over the long run, you know the casino is going to win. Um, so long-term predictability. There is an applet here. Use the uh, probability applet to simulate the flipping of coins. So let's see if it works. This would be a good time to showcase some of those features from Canvas. I mean, from uh, my stat lab. So go to coursecompass.com. You can play with this on your own as well. It's available to you. Uh-oh, everything's super slow, so I hope it works. So a multimedia library. Applets right in there, and then you're going to hit uh, chapter five, 
applets. Fine now. And we're going to use this one that says uh, simulating the probability of heads with a fair coin. Okay. So let's click that guy. Oh, good. Okay. Looks like it's worked. Okay. So what we're looking at here, let me make this a little bit bigger. This is a little applet that uh, that was created to help you see again this concept that there's short-term uncertainty with long-term predictability. So we're going to flip a coin right here. Just one time we're going to flip a coin. And there it is. And we flipped it and it turned out to be heads. Okay. Uh, we're going to keep track of how many times we get heads. That's what we're going to do. So that's what this guy right here is. This is the proportion of the times we got heads. We flipped it once, we got the heads, so right now the proportion is 100% of the time we get heads. Okay? Alright, let's say we flip it again. <coughs> okay, we flipped it and we got a tails. So, so far we've gotten heads once, tails once, so uh, how many times have we have heads? One out of two times. So one out of two is equal to 50%. So <clears throat> that's 0.5, and that's why this is this is right there at the 0.5. Okay, let's flip it one more time. Now we got heads again. Okay, so let me write that down. We got heads, tails, heads. You just want to do the uh, the uh, algebra behind it. Okay, we flipped it one time, and we got heads. Right, so right now the result is one out of one, and so that just turns into one. And then the second time we flipped it, we got a tails. So how many times have we got heads? We got one out of two. One out of two is equal to 0 0.50 if we divide those two things. And then the third time we flipped it, we got back to having heads. So now we have heads twice, right? Let's count the number of times we, we received the heads. There's one, two. So we received heads twice, two out of three times. If we turn that into a decimal, we get 0 0.6666. So we can just round it to 67. Good. 0.67. And if we go back to this guy, then we see that that's what it charted. It, chart, it charts the point, this guy right here. I thought it was going to show you what it is. Um, it, it highlights 0.6, oh, now it does it. There it is. 0.6666666, right? That's after three flips. So the short-term uncertainty. When we flip a coin, who knows, right? The next time I flip this, um, the new coin that's going to appear right here has no memory of what happened before. It's unconnected to that. It can either be a heads or it could be a tails, right? So I think most of us intuitively know that that means that there's a 50% chance, there's a one out of two chance that this next coin is going to be either a heads or a tails. There's uncertainty. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay, it turned out to be a tails. So, so far with four flips, we have two heads and out of four. So two heads out of four. We divide the 2 divided by 4, again we get to 0 0.5, and that's what's graphed right here, this 0.5. So we can keep doing this over and over and over. Let's get to 10 times. There, I've done it 10 times, and if I keep track, I did 1, 2, whoa, that's, that's not... Happy. Can I do it this way? Okay. Keeping track of how many heads, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight heads. Okay, and then they keep track of it right here. So eight heads. So right now I have eight out of ten uh, times I flipped it. I flipped it ten times and eight of those times I got a head. So right now I have a point eight uh the proportion of times that I that I have received heads right now is 0 0.8. Good. So that's what it's being graphed right here. This one is a 0.8. So we were keeping track of sort of the running proportion of heads throughout this process. You know, the first time we flipped it, it was a head, so we got 100. 
The second time we got a tail, so we went down to 50. Then we got a head, so then we got a 0.67. Then we got a tail, we went back to 0.5. And then it looks like every single time after that, we kept getting heads, 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 heads. We went on this little run of nothing but heads. And so at this stage, we have eight out of 10 heads. Good. Are there any questions so far about what I'm doing? No? Okay, short-term unpredictability. The next coin could be a heads, or it could be a tails, and it's unrelated to anything that has happened before, right? The new coin won't care what happened the first 10 flips. It's a brand new coin, it's a brand new flip. You still have a 50-50 a chance, right? A 50% chance of getting a heads. Good? Okay, um, and the long-term predictability comes in tracking what happens as we keep track of all, all of these coins. So let's uh, flip it one more time. Oh look, another heads, right? So it looks like we are on this little run of heads, 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 heads. If this was a game in Las Vegas, this would be something that they would put on a little screen next to the game. Come flip coins and they go, look, we keep getting nothing but heads, 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 heads. So in the past 11 times we flipped a coin, nine of them had been heads. So some people might look at that and they might think, oh, wow, tails is due this, this concept that because we've been getting a bunch of heads, that that means that there's a, a higher likely chance that maybe the next one is going to be a tails, right? The tail, tails is due. We've had this long run of, head, of heads. Um, some people think that. And some people think, no, 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 look, you know, the, the, the heads are on a streak. Um, you know, they're, they're hot. You know, we should bet money that the next one is going to be a heads, right? I don't know where you, where you guys lie. If you're on the camp that thinks that because 9 out of 11 times it has been heads, that means that the, the heads are hot and therefore you should bet money that the next one's also going to be a heads. Or maybe you think, oh, there's been too many heads. The next one should be a tails. It's hot. Uh, it's due. Um, both of those are silly. They, they have nothing to do with it. The next coin has no interest, no care, not affected by what happened in the previous 11 flips. There's really a 50-50 chance that the next coin is going to uh, be a heads uh, or a tails. Okay, but so short-term unpredictability. Right, the next coin, I don't know what it's going to happen. It could be a heads, it could be a tails. But let's let's flip five coins at a time. Okay, so let's just hit that guy, and it's just going to automatically do five coins, and keep track of what's happening. Okay, and so now I'm going to jump over to this button. What this button is going to do is that it's automatically going to flip the coin a thousand times. And we're no longer going to see this little animation thing because it's going to flip it a thousand times. Just know that that's what's happening. Okay, and as soon as I hit that button, you're going to see this thing go crazy. Right, because it's going to keep track of what's happening with all those flips. Right now, this is keeping track of 16 flips. With 16 flips, uh, uh, at the moment, there's been 12 out of 16, 12 heads out of 16 flips for a proportion of 0.75. Okay, so if you divide 12 by 16, you're gonna get 0.75. Good, so at the moment, 75% of the times that I flipped this coin, it has turned out to be heads. That's what this is saying. Okay, so I'm gonna hit this thing and it's gonna automatically jump to 1,016 flips. Like that, right? So that's what this whole thing is. It's really a bunch of individual little dots that are connected that show you what's happening uh, with this ratio. So after 1,016 uh, times that I flipped the coin, 515 turn out to be heads and the rest tails. If I divide these two numbers together, 515 divided by 1,016, it'll turn out to be 0 0.5069. Good, pretty close to 50%. If I do it again, I'll get 2,000 flips. Good. So now, uh, out of 2,016 flips, 1,009 have turned out to be heads. When I divide this number by this number, I get the 0 
right? Let's say I flip it again, and 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 again, and again, and again. So let's get to like 10,000. After 10,016 times that I flipped it, approximately 5,010 have been heads. So when I divide these two, I get 0 0.5002, okay? And that's when we arrive to long-term predictability, right? When I flip one coin, if I just flip one coin, I have no idea what it's gonna be. Could be heads, could be tails. I don't know, turns out to be tails, I don't know. What's the next one gonna be? I don't know, heads could be tails, I don't know, right? There's unpredictability in what's gonna happen next. There's a 50-50 chance that um, the next one is heads or the next one is tails. But in the long run, I can be very, very confident that about half will be heads, right? So if, let's, let's reset it again. Let's, if, if you just ask me, do you want to put $1,000 that the next coin is going to be a heads? I don't want to do that. There's a unpredictability. I don't know. It might be, oh, look at that. I would have lost $1,000, right? On the other hand, let's reset it. And if you ask me, if I flip this 10,000 times, do you want to put $1,000 that pretty close to 5,000 of those times will be heads? Yeah, I'm pretty confident. Um, like if you think... You know, I'll bet you a thousand dollars that if I flip this a thousand, a ten thousand times, that eight thousand of those will be heads. I will take that bet. That's not going to happen, right? There's long-term predictability. About half the coins will turn out to be heads in the long run, right? Let's say I flip this ten thousand times. There, ten thousand times. Look pretty close to half, not exactly half. There's always going to be a little element of uncertainty, but very, very little compared to just flipping one coin. Good. So if I flip this a million times, I'm very, very confident that about 500,000 of those will be heads and 500,000 will be tails or something really close to that. If it's something very far from that, um, then there's something weird going on. Right, long-term predictability tells me that as long as I repeat the experiment many, 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 many times, there is long-term certainty. Good? So this is again what Vegas does. When one player sits down at a table, you know, there's uncertainty. The player is playing with this. Am I gonna win? Am I gonna lose? Am I gonna win? Am I gonna lose? There's a lot of uncertainty. When the casino is playing, they're playing thousands and thousands of hands every single minute so they're playing with long-term predictability. They, they don't really have a, a, uh, uh, too much fear that they're going to lose. They know that if they play this hand, say uh, 20,000 times in one day, 20,000 times they played this game, look, pretty close to about half of them were heads and about half of them were the tails. So they can, they, if they wanted to create this game in Vegas, flip a coin, um, they know that about half the time they're going to be winners and about half the time they're not, they're not going to be winners. Good? Any questions about this duality about short-term uncertainty versus long-term uh, certainty? No? No? No, 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 no. Um, more recently, I remember reading an article about the toilet paper industry. Um, you know, we recently had a, a, a an issue, right, with the supply of uh, toilet paper. So I was reading an article because I'm a nerd about why and what's going on there. So I know way more about the toilet paper industry than I ever thought I'd know. Uh, but at any rate, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, toilet paper is very bulky, so. In order for, um, so it, it, if they were going to, um, if they wanted to make sure that the supply was always consistent and they adjusted for, um, for upticks in demand, uh, they would have like a warehouse system, you know, a giant warehouse where you store a bunch of toilet paper. That way when there's an increase in demand, you know, you go to your storage and then you have some, you know, you're able to restock the shelves pretty quickly. However, you know, toilet paper is very bulky. They would need really, really big warehouses. 
Um, and um, you know, you got to put shelves on these warehouses. You got to put people to work at these warehouses. Um, there's always the possibility of damage. Uh, you know, if it gets wet, for example, or too too humid, um, you know, stuff like that. So it's really expensive for the companies to maintain a warehouse system. So instead, they apply statistics to try and understand what the demands are going to be so that they can make them just in time. They go right from the factory straight to the stores. They don't really have too much of a warehouse system. So when there was an unexpected spike in demand, they didn't have any extra storage, you know, stored capacity somewhere to meet that demand. Um, uh, so this was short-term uncertainty, right? An unusual event where, you know, there was a sudden spike in demand for toilet paper, you know, a few months ago. But that's a very unusual anomaly for them. Usually they're very good at being able to to estimate what the demand is going to be uh, from time to time, right? Uh, with the exception of, you know, a, a few months ago, right after the COVID thing, with, with the exception of that, we've never really run into any problems, right? There's never really been another time where like, oh man, everybody wanted toilet paper, but there isn't any um, on the shelves, right? They, they do a really good job of producing as much as they need, as, as, the, as consumers need, uh, because they use long-term predictability about uh, about the demands of toilet paper in the country, and they produce, they you know, they they set up their production to meet that demand. Good. So long-term predictability, even though there was a short-term uh, uncertainty, short-term short spike. Okay. Any questions about any of this? No. 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 Okay, let's play with a different one. Um, well, that one I think maybe um, was a little hard to see because of the 50% thing. But let's say you're doing the exact same situation. You're flipping a coin. You're in Vegas, and there's this the hottest new game is flip a coin, guess what it's going to be, right? That's what the game is. So you flip a coin, you're like, oh, okay, it's gonna be heads. Okay, one out of one time, it's a heads. Flip a coin. Okay, look, we get heads again. Flip a coin. Finally, we get tails. Okay, so we start tracking that um, the proportion of heads. So we had one head and then another head. So we were at 100% after two flips. And then we finally got a tails on the third one. So right now we have two out of three uh, as the proportion of heads so far. Let's flip it again, let's get to 10. Okay, so look, I flipped it 10 times, and there was a lot of heads. Nine out of 10 times, 0.9 of them um, have been heads so far. So again, there's a certain amount of short-term unpredictability, but as I do this, um, you know, more and more and more, I start to see a pattern of what happens. So now I'm going to jump over to the button over here that will do them a thousand times. So now if I do it a thousand times, that's one thousand and ten times, two thousand and ten times, three thousand and ten times. Let's get over to like ten thousand times. Now if I flip this coin ten thousand times. It looks like 7,929 out of 10,000 turned out to be heads. That's very, very far from what I expected to be half, right? We, we expect that in the long run, about half of them are going to be heads. So what's happening here is that the long-term uh, predictability here is telling you that this is not a fair coin. This is closer to 80% of the, uh, the time it'll be a heads. This is a trick coin of some kind that is designed to to land on heads more often than it lands on tails. Good. Questions, 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 questions. What do you mean by trick coin? So there's a way to construct the coin. Maybe the weight, maybe the material. Uh, maybe the guy is just really good at flipping it and, and, and has you know learned some sort of way to have some measure of control. 
I remember I did that as a kid. I, I, I tried to learn how to flip it in a very specific, deliberate way so that I had a pretty good chance of it landing in you know how I wanted it to. I wasn't perfect at it, so sometimes I messed up, but I was fairly good at it, so it was better than half. So if I if I was going to be playing with people, like, let's just flip a coin and see if you can guess what it's going to be, I was better than half. I, w I was better than 50% chance of, of landing it. So um, um, in, in this case, this coin is clearly not a fair coin that lands on heads and tails at the same uh, likelihood because if I do it thousands of times, I can see that it doesn't land on about half. It lands at about 80%. Does that answer your question? Yes. Good, 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 good. So as far as your homework goes, um, there will be cases where you're presented with something like rolling a die or flipping a coin, some sort of an experiment. And in some cases, the, the results might fall in line what you intuitively think, uh, but in some cases it might not, and that's because maybe it might not be a, uh, a fair die or a fair coin, something that works the way you think it does, um, or it might be something that's completely um, you know, unpredictable intuitively, right? So um, if, if, if we just decide to play a game, you know, just kind of make something up, here, let me grab a prop from around here. <clears throat> this little elephant guy. What if I just want to roll this and I want to know as I roll it on the floor, what are the odds that it lands right on its feet, right? It seems there's several things that could happen. It lands on its feet or maybe it lands on its side or maybe it lands upside down like this, right? Um, there's some things that can't happen. It's never going to land like that, right? It can't balance itself this way. But it seems to me the most likely thing that could happen is that it lands like that, right, on its side. Though it's possible that it can land on its feet, right, but how do we figure it out? How do I know the probability that if it roll it, it'll land on its feet? Well, one way to do that is just to repeat it over and over and over thousands and thousands and thousands of times and keep track of how often it happens, right? That's empirical probability. We're about to get into that in a minute. That's what empirical probability is. You're just experimental probability. Just do it over and over and over and keep track of it. So if I do this 10,000 times and it turns out that 1,000 out of 10,000 times it lands on its feet, then I can be pretty confident likelihood that it lands like this. So there's a 10% chance that it lands on its feet. Good. Sort of, kind of, maybe, 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 sort of. Okay, now if you notice this app here, there was this green line here. This green line here is showing you where that 80% mark is. So this software program was already giving you um, a coin where the probability of landing on heads was 80%. So we kind of already expected that was going to happen. Now with one flip, you know, in the, in the short term, there's uncertainty. One flip, okay, we got a heads. Two flips. Okay, we got a tails. So see, it's kind of dancing all over the place, above the green line, below the green line. Uh, but if I keep going, eventually, the blue line is going to get pretty close to the green line. Right? After uh, just a few flips, it's getting closer and closer. It'll dance above it, below it, above it, below it. Uh, so sometimes it's right on it. Now it's just a little bit above it a little bit above it, maybe, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty that happens in the short term. But I know that as I flip this many, many, many times, eventually this is going to become really close to that green line because that's the line that represents 0.8%, right? So see how, um, zoom in here, sometimes it went above it, the proportion, the running proportion of heads was above the 0.8%, and then it was equal to it, and then a little bit below, and then a little bit above, and a little below, a little below, 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 and eventually somewhere around there. Good. 
short-term uncertainty, long-term predictability, right? It's like the casino games. Sometimes you're way above, you know, you're winning a lot. Sometimes you're winning, uh, you know, you're losing. Uh, but over the long run, you have to know you're going to lose, right? Casino always wins in the long run. Yeah, good, 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 good. Okay, all right, so let's get back to um, this thing. Mm. Oh, let, let's do one other one. So we did a lot with coins. Let's do one with, uh, oops, the, this other one that's about rolling a die. So here's another intuitive one. We roll one six-sided die, and we're keeping track of how many times we get a six when we roll a die. Maybe this is Las Vegas' hottest game. Roll a die and guess if it's a six or not. So we roll it one time. There it goes. Okay, it was a four. You're a loser. Give me your money, right? Roll it again. You're a loser. Give me your money, right? So we're just keeping track of the event. It's a six. That's where you put your money on, that it's going to be a six. So intuitively, assuming it's a fair die, there are six equal uh, six sides to the die. It's a six-sided die. So um, intuitively, maybe we already know that it should be one out of six are the odds that it lands on any one of those particular sides, assuming it's a fair die. But even if you don't know that, and we're going to get into how I got one out of six in a little bit, but even if you don't know that, we can just keep track of what happens in the long run, right? Just start rolling your die. Roll it, roll it, roll it, and keep track of how often you get a six. So, so far, we haven't gotten it at all. We've rolled it six times. We've gotten a six zero times, or seven times, eight times, nine times. Oh, we finally got one. Look at that. Okay. So right now, we've flipped, uh, we've rolled the die 10 times, and we only saw a six one time. So if I had to um, make a guess at what the odds are of getting a six, I would say it's one out of 10, which is 10%. There's a 10% chance that I would get a, uh, a, a six based on just these 10 rolls, right? Again, short-term uncertainty, the next time I roll it, who knows what it's going to be, right? There's a lot of uncertainty with just one roll. However, I know that if I do this a thousand rolls, a thousand times, eventually the true proportion will sort of emerge. Out of a thousand and twelve rolls, 169 of those were uh, a six. If I divide these two, I get this decimal, 0.67. And the real answer is 0 0.16666666, which rounds to 0 0.167. So this is really right on the money on what it's supposed to be, right? Long term, yeah, in the long term, look, it's really, really, really close to what it's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be 1 0.166666, and it's really close to that, right? This green line, again, shows you where it's supposed to be. And we see that if we keep track of it, sometimes that proportion went above it, sometimes it went below it, sometimes it was right on it, but eventually, in the long run, it gets really close to it. Good. Any more questions on any of this? All right, let's get back to our PowerPoint then. All right, so we use the simulation. So probability is the measure of the likelihood of a random phenomenon or chance behavior occurring. Probability describes the long-term proportion with, with which a certain outcome will occur in situations with short-term uncertainty. Okay, so uh, probability deals with experiments that yield random short-term results or we call them outcomes. So that's, that's a word we have to know in, in this chapter, outcomes. Yet reveal long-term predictability. So long-term uh, proportion in which a certain outcome is observed is the probability of that outcome. So as we saw with the rolling of the die and the flipping of a coin, in the short term there's uncertainty. I'm not willing to bet any money on what's going to happen with one roll of the die, or I'm not willing to bet any money on what's going to happen with one flip of the coin, but I'm willing to put a lot of money down that I can predict what's going to happen, approximately what's going to happen if I do it 10,000 times. Right? With a with a rolling of a die, I know that about 0 0.1666 uh, 
uh, uh, proportions of the times, right? Which is, it, turn, it turns out to be one six, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, the probability that we roll a six uh, according to my my little program there, it, it, it approximates this, right? Uh, which is approximately 16.6% of the, it's approximately 16.67% uh, of the time. Good. So if I were going to roll one die, what's going to happen? I don't know, and I'm not willing to put any money on it. But if we're going to roll, um, you know, 10,000 of these dice, I'm pretty confident that about about 16% of these. Now, how do you get that? We're going to multiply 0.1667, let's say we go to those, times uh, 10,000. <clears> times 10,000. And that's going to give you approximately 1,667. So I am willing to bet a lot of money that approximately 1,667 out of the 10,000 times you roll a die, we're going to get a 6. I'm willing to put my house on it. Somewhere close to it, right? Now it might be 1,680. It might turn out to be 1,628, right? So something kind of close to it. So, you know, something kind of close, let's say somewhere between 1,000. 600 and somewhere within 1,700. I'm fairly confident that if I roll this die 10,000 times, it's going to land, and we keep track of how many times we get a six, it's going to land somewhere in between these two numbers, right? I'm very confident of that, and I'm willing to bet a lot of money that that's what's going to happen, right? Long term predictability. You know who else is willing to bet a lot of money? The casinos. That's what they do. They are looking at uh, playing the game thousands and thousands and thousands of times with lots of different players, and so they can use statistics to be pretty confident in what's going to happen. Right? Casinos aren't really taking too many chances. They they can use statistics to get a lot of predictability. Good. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Okay. The law of large numbers. As the number of repetitions of a probability experiment increases, the propor proportions with which a certain outcome is observed gets closer and closer to the probability of the outcome. Right. So again, that's again playing with the same same things we've been playing with. Um, if I wanted to roll this die and see what is the probability that we get a six, okay, we're going to show that this is the real answer. That it really is 0.6. 0.166666, approximately 16.67%. We're going to get that as the real theoretical answer. Um, but uh, this law of large numbers says that if we just repeat the experiment a large number of times and keep track of the running total of what's happening, that in the long run, uh, eventually that ratio, that proportion, is going to get infinitely close to the real probability. Are there any questions about that? Maybe, maybe, sort of, kind of. So if you want to figure out what is the probability of something, uh, one way you can do it is just to repeat it, right? The experiment over and over and over again until, uh, and keep track of the results until you get a pretty good idea. Like um, when they have that half court thing uh, in basketball games where they pick some person and they go, here, you get one shot from the half court and if you make it, you know, you get a big prize. Uh, what are the odds that if you get selected and you're going to go to the half court and you shoot that ball one time, what are the odds that you're going to make that? Some people think, well, it's, it's half, right? You either make it or you don't, 50%. But that's not true, right? If you think about it. Some people have a really good chance of making it. They're really good. Like they make it all the time. And some people have very little chance, right? They don't even have the strength to get the ball close to the hoop. 
So, you know, they airball it and they can't even get anywhere close. So those people have very little chance of making it, right? So it's definitely not just you make it or you don't make it, so it's 50%. That's not how that works. So how can we figure it out? Let's say you have been selected. You know that next month uh, there's going to be a game and you are going to go to the half, uh, half, uh, the half court marker and you're going to shoot the ball and see if you make it. What are the odds that you make it? Well, one way you could do that is just to go practice and do it over and over and over and over and over and keep track of how often you make it. If you go and you try it and you've tried it 10,000 times and you only made it once, you know you have a really low chance, right? Your, 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 the likelihood, the probability that you make it is going to be really low. On the other hand, if you go practice and you, and you shoot it 10,000 times and you make it, 9,000 times out of 10,000, you're pretty good. And you know you have a really good chance of, of, of making it once that game comes around, right? So as you do this a large number of times and you keep track of that running proportion, that, uh, proportion of times that you do something, that proportion will begin to approximate, uh, get infinitely close to the true probability of that outcome. Any questions about that? We're good, we're good, good. Okay, a little bit more on language and some definitions. So in probability, an experiment is any process that can be repeated in which the results are uncertain. Uncertain. Um, you know, for us, we often work with flipping a coin. That's an experiment. Flip a coin, there's a certain amount of uncertainty. Is it heads, is it tails? Um, that's our experiment. It could be rolling a die. Maybe it's a six-sided die. It could be, you know, you roll it. Any one of those six sides could, could turn out to be the result. It could be a nine-sided die, a 12-sided die, right? So there's different kinds of die that it could be. Um, the experiment could be something about a deck of cards, right? You have a 52-card deck of cards, and then you pick one out, you know, is that card a queen? That kind of question. An experiment can also be something as simple as you stop someone and you randomly ask them a question, right? We randomly stop a student walking down the hall and we ask them, you know, did you drive to school or did you take public transportation? Did you walk? You know, ask them a question. There's your experiment, right? There's a certain amount of uncertainty from you, the, the, uh, uh, the person asking the question. You don't know what they're going to say. Uh, so that could be our experiment. Good. The sample space S, we use a capital letter S to represent our sample space. Um, uh, is the probability of the probability experiment is the collection of all possible outcomes. Good. So if the experiment is, you know, experiment could be as simple as flip a coin, um, then the sample space S is all the possible outcomes. So if we flip a coin one time, uh, one time, then either we get tails or we get heads. Those are the two possible outcomes. Okay. Um, an event is the collections of the outcomes from the probability experiment, right? So these things are events. Usually we denote the simple events uh, uh, with a letter E with a little subscript of I. So we would say that simple event number one could be that maybe you get a tails, and simple event number two could be that maybe you get a heads. Good. So therefore, we can also describe our sample space as S equals to simple event one comma simple event two. Good. Maybe, 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 sort of, kind of, sort of, kind of. Okay. From the simple events, we will combine them together to come up with compound events, more complicated events. Um, and let's see an example of where that happens. I think this is a good one for that. Consider the probability experiment of having two children. Okay, so you're going to have two kids. Uh, identify the outcomes of the probability experiment. So let's just use the letter B to represent that you had a boy and G to represent the event that you had a girl. And you're having two children. 
So the, the sample space is made up of the following events. Either your first child was a boy and your second child was a boy. Uh, in fact, let's not put a comma there. So I'm just going to use the two letters back to back like that to represent that the first child was a boy, the second child was a boy, comma. Or it could be that the first child was a boy, the second one was a girl, comma. Or it could be that the first one was a girl, the second one was a boy, comma, or it could be that they were both girls, right? We've covered all the possible outcomes. There are four possible outcomes that make up our sample space. Good. Good, good, good. Okay, any one of these individual uh, events that can happen here are simple events. So simple event number one can be described as BB. Simple event number two could be described as BG. Simple event number three could be described as GB. And simple event number four could be described as GG. So our sample space defined this way can also be written as E sub one comma E sub two comma E sub three comma E sub four. Right, so these are simple events. Define, identify the outcomes of the probability experiment. Okay, determine the sample space. So we've we've uh, we've done that already. Right. So these are the possible outcomes in here. So that's the answer to part A. And part B is S equals to this. So we can either write it this way or this way. Right. I think just kind of formatting it to this, I would say that this is the answer to part A identify the outcomes of the experiment and either this or this either one of them can be thought of as the answer to part B determine the sample space and now part C define the event capital V have one boy okay so this is a compound event this is an event that's more complicated than simple events because here are our simple events and more than one of these uh, simple events can satisfy this statement have one boy right so event capital event E capital E has um, you know this have one boy have one boy but remember the experiment is have two children so have one boy must automatically mean that the other one must be a girl so this is made up of the events boy girl comma um, boy girl or girl boy right and these two are different because in the context of this of this situation the order does matter because it means that you first had a boy then a girl so in this case the boy is older right Who's the big brother? Who's the older one? Right? And in this scenario, you first have the girl and then the boy. So in this scenario, the girl is the older one. So it is noticeable when one first you have the boy, then the girl, versus the girl, then the boy. In a different situation, a different context, a different meaning, there might not be a way to determine the difference. It might make absolutely no difference whatsoever. Uh, and in a case like that, you would recognize that there is no difference, and then you would just consider them together. Like, oh, it's a boy, one boy, you know, unit one, unit two, and there's no way to distinguish the two of them. So that might make up one thing. Okay. Good, 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 good. Okay, so now another kind of ambiguous thing here um, that that you know I would prefer this if it had said have exactly one boy versus have at least one boy right so what if this had said you know event event uh, w capital w equals have at least one boy at least one boy then that allows the possibility that we have a uh, a boy and a girl or a girl and a boy 
but at least one boy allows the possibility that we have two boys. Good. Okay, and now we can also use this other notation we created up here to describe this. So BG is also otherwise known as E sub 2. GB is also otherwise known as E3. And BB is known as E1. Right, so this is another way of describing this statement. Have at least one boy. Have one boy is just these two. Right, so I'm interpreting this to mean exactly exactly one boy. Good. And again, using this notation, then capital E is made up of simple events E sub 2 and E sub 3. Right, from up here. E sub 2, boy, girl. E sub 3, girl, boy. Any questions about this? Uh, I have a question about the uh, Adam Katie. So it doesn't have to be in chronological order, correct? So right here you have E sub 2, E sub 3, and E sub 1. It wouldn't have to be 1, 2, and 3? Correct. It does not. Uh, in terms of statistics, it doesn't matter. We're simply listing all the possibilities. And the reason I wrote it this way is because I wanted it to kind of match this one to this one, this one to this one, and this one to this one as I defined them up here. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Now, it doesn't matter, but, you know, customary, tradition, then, yes, I should put it in this order. It looks a little prettier, but I, I wouldn't be able to mark anybody wrong for doing this. And as far as your homework goes, when you put it on uh, on my stat lab, um, it should the system should understand that this is the same as that, and it shouldn't penalize you or anything. But you know, just to make sure that there isn't any issues with the technology, it would be better to try and present it in a, in this format. It's just prettier, but it it doesn't have to be the case, right? And it won't always be a sequential thing. Like you know, a different question might have that the answer is E sub 1, E sub 7, and E sub 13, something like that. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't be able to write them out in, in, a, in a chronological order anyway. Well, I mean, I guess you would, but it wouldn't be as pretty as 1, 2, 3. Okay, any other questions? No, 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 no. Okay, let's keep going. Um, yeah, okay, so this is what the author responded to this. So it's the same answers I got. Boy, 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 girl, girl, boy. Okay, same thing as I got. Okay, probability rules. The probability of an event, E, right, capital letters are, uh, are designated as, as compound events. And notice the notation for probability. We, note it, we use this notation to mean the probability of an event. A giant P, parentheses, parentheses, and then a description of what the probability is, right? So this is probability of probability of, and then whatever is in here. Now, we usually use uh, capital letter E's to represent some sort of an event, uh, or it might be written down, right? So we might say probability that we roll, roll, uh, roll a three, for example. That could be written there. Probability that we roll a three. Uh, or, um, you know, we can also use this kind of notation where we go, okay, probability that the die equals a 3. Like, hopefully that's still, you know, it's easy to tell what that is, that we roll a 3, that the die equals a 3. Or, if we go over here and describe our event, let's say we describe event E to be equal to event E, we roll, roll a 3. Okay, so then when we want to write this notation down, we put a giant E there. So this is the probability that event E occurs. Okay, so this not notation is important. Capital P parentheses and then whatever's in here is the probability we're trying to find. So rules of probability. Uh, number one, the probability of any outcome is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1, uh, inclusive of the endpoints. And then if you want to put it in terms of percentage notation, then it's going to be either between 0 and 100%, right? So any event, P of E, is going to be less than or equal to 100%. The probability that anything happens is less than or equal to 100% or greater than or equal to 0%.
So in probability, there is no such thing as 110%. Right? The odds of something can't go over 100, right? And the odds of something can't be negative either. It's going to be one of these as a percentage and then turned into its decimal representation, then it's going to be somewhere between zero and the number one. Good, so that's that first rule. Rule number two is that the sum of all the simple events that make up uh, the sample space of an experiment, if we add up all of those probabilities, all those probabilities add up to one. That's what that's saying. Okay. Okay, so a probability model lists the possible outcomes of an experiment and each, uh, and each outcome's probability. A problem must uh, satisfy rules one and two of the rules of probability. Okay, so it's kind of like a cheat sheet. You have some sort of a game, you have some sort of an experiment, you write down all the possible outcomes of that experiment, that'll be your uh, sample space, and then you write down the likelihood, the probability of each of those possible outcomes, and that'll be a probability model. Good. So here's a quick example. We'll do this one and we'll stop for the day. Um, a probability model. So in a bag of peanut M&Ms, um, where am I? Peanut M&Ms, milk chocolate candies, the colors of the candies can be shown, can, sorry, can be brown, yellow, red, blue, orange, or green. So here are all the possible colors in this M&M bag. Uh, suppose that a candy is randomly selected from the bag. The table shows each color and the probability of drawing that color. Verify that the probability, uh, the probability rules are being satisfied here. So the color brown, yellow, red, blue, orange, green. And then we have an associated probability uh, to each one of those colors. So if we randomly select one candy from this bag, this is telling us that there's a 12% chance that it will be a brown one. Good. Um, another way of saying it is that approximately 12% of all the candies in the bag will be brown. Assuming it's a really big bag, right? Because we need that to be, you know, incorporate the, bag, the law of large numbers. So you have a tub, giant tub, uh, um, or like a fishbowl, right? It's a big party and I threw a bunch of M&Ms in there. It's like a giant fishbowl with a lot of them. Uh, I can be certain that about 12% of them are going to be brown, about 15% of them are going to be yellow, and so on and so forth. So in order to make sure that it satisfies our two rules, remember the two rules are, number one, that each probability is between 0 and 100% or between 0 and 1, and that's true here. Each one of these probabilities is between 0 and 1, so it satisfies that rule. And the second rule is that the sum of all these probabilities, right? Each one of these is a simple event. The probability that each one of these uh, simple events um, happens is going to be equal to one. So if we add up all these decimals, 0 0.12, 0 0.15, 0 0.12, 0 0.23, 0 0.23, 0 0.15, if we add them all up, they're gonna add up to one, which satisfies the second rule, right? Why does it have to be that they add up to one? Why should they add up to one, right? That's, that's let's think about that for a second. Why must it be that if I add all these, they add up to one, right? And remember, one is akin to 100%. Well, what would it mean if it didn't add up to 100%? What, if it, what would it mean if they only added up to 98%? Well, then what happens to that missing 2%, right? If all these colors only added up to 98% of all the, the, uh, the M&Ms, then you know, where would the missing 2 be? That would mean that there's a color that's missing Right? Is there a diff different color? But if there's a different color, that would mean that this table is incomplete, that there is some outcome that we're not considering. Right? Or maybe that um, you know there's something wrong with these probabilities because if we can account for 98%, then we don't know what happens to that other 2%, right? So it's not a proper probability table. Good? All right, so these things have to add up to 100% or they have to add up to 1%. Good. Questions, 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 questions. All right, so I've gone over my time for a little bit, so it's a good place to stop. Um, so we'll pick up on this tomorrow. Uh, for now, please make sure you get started on your homework, right? So go to um, um, the, the Pearson account, 
sorry, uh, go to um, coursecompass.com or Pearson Mastery. I always forget what it is. Lab and Mastering.com. Uh, you know, follow the links to or the instructional videos from before to create your account. Remember that you can open a free temporary account. You get two weeks uh, to get started on your homework uh, before you before they force you to pay for anything. Uh, so you should be able to get started now and and uh, you know, not have to pay anything until you're sure that you want to you know keep the class. Good. Are there any questions about anything before we? Sign off for the day.